Namaste, Namaskara, greetings. I welcome one and all to this uh, third edition of our work, virtual book reading session. And on behalf of our member secretary, Dr. Sachidananda Joshi ji, our uh, colleagues at the IGNCA Regional Center Bangalore and IGNCA New Delhi, I welcome all of you to this wonderful book reading session with Professor Dr. Sharda Srinivasan. Uh, Dr. Srinivasan is a unique scholar her work is beautifully poised at the intersection of arts, culture, and sciences. She is a world-renowned scholar and a recent Shri awardee for her long-standing expertise and scholarship at the intersection of metallurgy, archaeological disciplines, and sciences. Um, it's very rare that one finds a unique combination of a dancer uh, a cultural specialist, a scientist, a scholar, and a leader at once. So we are very happy uh, to have her present her work, her most recent book, which is going to be dedicated to her upcoming book on the metal working of the Kamalar and the Vishwakarma communities in South India. I will not go uh, in deep uh, on the important significance of this research, which will be very evident once she talks about her uh, research findings. But the, the work on these communities and these indigenous traditions is significant for several reasons. In addition to it being a significant effort in documenting the heritage of India and also documenting the metallurgical innovations and uh, indigenous knowledge systems that these communities have harbored, it is also a fascinating case of how communities and pedigree communities have harbored, nourished, sustained, and innovated with these uh, indigenous uh, knowledge systems, which have given rise to technological innovations in the past and are continuing to hold on to these uh, uh, traditions of, uh, of um, innovation. So her work today is uh, going to be uh, centered around that. I welcome uh, Dr. Srinivasan to this uh, virtual book reading session. She is uh, currently the she's currently heading the program at the National Institute for Advanced Studies. She's part of the School of Humanities there and heads the program on heritage, science and society, which is uh, her brainchild. Um, since its inception. So I welcome you to this book reading. And uh, we are also fortunate to have Dr. Molly Kaushal, who heads the Janapada Sampada division at IGNCA Delhi. And she will uh, present her observations and comments and discussions on the, on the larger topic today. And uh, without further ado, we will post, we'll carry on, we'll get ahead to the book reading itself. Detailed bios of both Dr. Srinivasan and uh, Dr. Molly Kaushal will be posted on the chat box for all of you to like read and get to know our uh, speakers and uh, and the uh, and the uh, observations that uh, Dr. Molly Kaushal will make. I also request all those of you who have joined us on the WebEx platform to like. Uh, post your questions and Q and A's on at, on the chat box. There will be a limited time at the very end of this session to actually interact with our uh, speaker on uh, issues and the comments containing per pertaining to the topic uh, here today. So, without further ado, I welcome Dr. Srinivasan. Over to you. I think you have to unmute yourself. I think you're um, yes. yes. So thank you so much, Dr. Deepti Navaratna, uh, Professor Molly Kaushal, for this wonderful opportunity to speak for IGNCA on this wonderful journey on this project. And once again, thank you so much to IGNCA Janapada Sampada Division, headed by uh, Professor Molly Kaushal and the Bangalore Regional Center, headed by uh, you. Uh, who've done such a wonderful and dynamic job, and also to um, Dr. Satyajan and Dosh Joshi for his uh, uh, for all the encouragement, and it's great to see this come to fruition. Um, and so I'll take you through some facets of this uh, uh, journey into the metalworking traditions of the Kamalar and Vishwarakarma communities of southern India. Um, and I will just proceed to share my screen now.
Is that visible now? Yes, ma'am. Yes, okay. Um, so, uh, as I was uh, mentioning, this has been a project that was supported by GNCA and also uh, brings together decades of my own efforts um, in these areas. And uh, I would also like to thank uh, Professor Koshel and, uh, you know, the wonderful inspirational exhibitions that she has also done, for instance, Leela and so on, which has inspired many of us as scholars. And uh, I should also pay my respects and gratitude for the inspiration of iconic figures who are no more with us. Dr. Kapila Vatsyayan, whom we lost just a few days ago, the legendary founder of IGNCA, who in fact also encouraged me in my doctoral work going back three decades. Uh, Professor Chetter, the past honorary director of IGNCA Bengaluru, who we also lost earlier this year. And he had also taken a lot of interest uh, to finish his book on Buddhist artisanal legacies just before he passed away. And he was also visiting professor at National Institute of Advanced Studies, Bengaluru, uh, where I am based. And uh, Professor Vijaya Ramaswamy, whom we lost in June 2020, who has also been a fellow traveler on the study of artisanal groups and weavers and so on. And uh, she gave valuable feedback towards the monograph and the films as reviewer. And I would also like to acknowledge Dr. Ian Glover uh, at the Institute of Archaeology, my past advisor, with whom I had also undertaken some of the work on the mirror makers and so on, which will also be touched upon today. Well, the Kamala and Vishwakarma of Southern India represent age old artisanal communities who have left behind an indelible imprint in terms of material culture and metals heritage. However, although the artistic legacy of temple sculpture and metal icons is generally known, there are lacunae in terms of a finer appreciation of the wider milieu of the metal crafts, the technocultural aspects, the living heritage of the knowledge systems, and the intertwinings with the sociocultural aspects. And I must qualify here that my study focuses mainly on approaches and findings from original fieldwork with respect to ethnometallurgical and archaeometallurgical documentation of fading practices, rather than the studies based on texts in epigraphical or inscriptional sources, or on social anthropological approaches and social history and so on, which has been covered uh, in, in some detail and very competently by several other scholars. So the book monograph comprises some 250 pages with uh, 250 photographs and sets out to chart the trajectories of important craft traditions in various parts of southern India, ranging from the copper ally repertoire of the making of metal icons, bells and vessels and symbols and so on, to the ferrous repertoire of blacksmithy and the legacy of wood steel to explore the broader intertwinings of culture and technology. Vishwakarma, who is venerated as the ancient Hindu god of engineering and architecture, going back to Vedic lore, is the maker of the world, as the Sanskrit term implies. And this has been expl as explicated quite well by Jan Brouwer in his seminal book on makers of the world, an anthropological study amongst blacksmiths in Karnataka, going back to 1995. Lord Vishwakarma, is like the divine Kalpa Vriksha or the tree of life, who is as high as the Mount Meru, the divine mountain, and keeps Mother Gayatri in his heart. As translated from the Kasyapa Shilpa Shastra, which is a medieval artistic treatise used uh, quite a lot in southern India and touched upon by Professor Nanda Gopal, Churamani Nanda Gopal. Of course, we had a celebration of Ananda Kumaraswamy's writings a few days ago with IGNCA. And An Ananda Kumaraswamy, who was both geologist and then turned into an art historian, uh, evokes a holistic link between the conceptual significance of the universal creative principle of Vishwakarma and the lived artistic traditions in order to understand the transformation of nature into plastic arts. 
albeit in a somewhat idealized vision. And in Transformation of Nature and Art, Ananda Kumaraswamy writes, there is indeed but one authority, Paramatma, whose knowledge is universal, Vishwa, and innate, Shaja, not acquired by instruction or practice, that is the Lord as Vishwakarma or Tvashtra. And you see here the sketch of Lord Vishwakarma with five faces, done by Dr. Uday Kumar. And just a couple of days ago, we also had the event of Vishwakarma Puja, which is observed on the 17th of September, particularly in parts of Northern India. Late Vijaya Ramaswamy had also explained that the Indian craftsperson conceives of his art not as his own, nor as the accumulated skill of ages, but as originating in the divine skill of Vishwakarma and revealed by him. And you see here a painting of Vishwakarma and his five sons from Kanamangalam, which is a blacksmith's workshop in Tamil Nadu. And the descendants of Lord Vishwakarma are Manu, referring to the blacksmiths, Maya, the carpenters, Twashtha, the metal casters, Shilpi, or stonemasons, and Vishwajna, or the goldsmiths. Now, the term Vishwakarma refers to the endogamous fivefold craft communities and is more often used in northern India, but also in parts of Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh, and Goa. In some parts of southern India, and especially in Tamil Nadu and Kerala, the communities were also known by different names, such as Kamalar, Panchala, Achari, uh, Chilpachari, Anjanatar, and so on, analogous to the fivefold clans. And the once powerful fivefold kinship of the Kamalar had spread also to Ceylon, Burma, and Java, according to Ananda Kumaraswamy. The five occupational groups known by their Tamil names as Tattar goldsmiths, Kannar bronze workers, Tachar carpenters, Kal Tachar stonemasons, and Kollars or Kollans or blacksmith were classified as Kamalar or Panchala. And in Sri Lanka as well, some of these Tamil non nomenclatures are found. Of course, some of the Vishwakarma and Kamalar communities in Karnataka and Andhra Pradesh and Tamil Nadu envisage their status as being on par or even superior to the priestly community of Brahmins on the basis of the origin from Parabrahman or Virata Vishwakarman as the creator and regard themselves as Vishwa Brahmins. Thus, as pointed out by Kumaraswamy and other scholars, Often the Panchala performed priestly rites in connection with consecration of images and were accorded certain special privileges, taking on the role of Brahmin priests in such rituals. But it must be mentioned that whereas in actual practice, the fivefold groupings of craftspeople were not uniformly accorded a privileged position in the overall scheme of caste and social hierarchies, and with some facets of discriminations as also indicated in inscriptional and anthropological studies by various scholars. But what makes the narrative of the Kamala so compelling is the innovative ways in which they sought to negotiate, subvert or reposition themselves in terms of social stratification through their origin myths, rituals and worldviews. The medieval Chola inscriptions give some insights into the social milieu of the Kamalar community and throw some light on their struggles for social enhancement of their positions. For example, with the subdivisions into the left-handed and right-handed castes, with the former being less privileged than the latter. The Kamala Rathakara are also mentioned in the 12th century inscription of Tiruvarur of Tanjavur district, where the Rathakara conveys the itinerant nature also related to the processional chariot. Bertenstein had reported that the Kamalas are sons of the Kshatriyas fathers and Vaishya mothers, i.e. the warrior and merchant caste respectively, suggesting some of these mobilities in terms of the social constructs. A Tamil inscription of Rajaraja Choran of the Brihadishwara temple in Tanjavur in Tamil Nadu mentions land grants of the 11th century, whereby one brazier or kannan was assigned one share of land and for one master carpenter, one and a half share. In recent times, however, in the Tanjavur district and elsewhere, 
The Kamala referred to bronze and bell metal workers, and the metal icon makers are known as tapatis, which is also the term used to describe the stone masons and the stone icon makers. Many of the cultural hubs where metal artisanship developed lie close to riverine ecosystems to be able to avail of the alluvial molding clays as seen in the Kaveri region. The image of Vishwakarma made by the traditional icon makers of Sri Kantastavati and the family of Swami Malai, which lies on the banks of the Kaveri, four kilometers from Kumbakonam, is seen in this slide, and they're a very eminent and renowned uh, master craftspeople. Well, Chola inscriptions describe South Indian bronzes as Sheppu Thirumani or copper images of the Lord. And the Brihadishwara temple of the 11th century built by Raja Raja Cholan at Tanjavur had no less than 60 metal icons of, according to inscriptions, of which only two are now extant. And one is, of course, of Ardavalan or Nataraja, the family deity or Kula Devata of the Cholas, along with the consort Shivakami. And typically, a lot of lamps and so on were also donated to the temples for the worships. And inscriptions mention the 400 dancers attached to the temples who were also the donors of lamps and such like the Devadasis and the Nachiyar, along with the queens or Nampiratiyar and the ruling elite and the royal patrons. Now, although images of craftspeople themselves are scarcely depicted in ancient India, there is a rare metal image portraying the stone mason Brahma Dirayar in the Tanjavur Art Gallery, who built a fortification wall around 11th century Brihadishwara temple, which indicates the reverence in which he was held. Well, the most spectacular Chola bronze is of Nataraja, the Hindu god of Shiva as lord of dance, which is uh, also been written about widely by numerous artists and scholars. And Ananda Kumaraswamy wrote of the Panchakritya or the five activities of Shiva from Shaiva Siddhantic texts of the 13th century, where he described the drum of creation being balanced by the fire of samhara or destruction, as and he is thought to dance the Ananda Tandava or the dance of bliss, which is in its own way also a, a furious and destructive dance balancing these diverse aspects of creation and destruction and movement and stability. Now, one should also mention that the Nataraja image also comes into vogue in the Aditurai temple built by Sembian Mahadevi in terms of the stone form of the early 10th century. And this temple also has a bronze image of Nataraja. And there is also a very fine bronze in the Freer Gallery of Art, which has been thought by some scholars to represent the widowed queen Sembi and Mahadevi, under whom the Nataraja image also came widely into vogue. Now, one should also mention that there is an inscription in Aduture, this temple built by this remarkable Chola Dowager queen, Sembi and Mahadevi in the 10th century, which mentions that the Kamalar community were the left-hand Vaishnavas. And there is also a stone sculpture of the architect Satan Gunabattan, which is found in the 10th century Uma Maheshwara temple at Koneri Rajapuram, also erected by Sembian Mahadevi. However, we don't see too many examples of inscriptions related to individual metal icon makers, although, of course, there are inscriptions mentioning don donors of images and lamps and so on. The age-old process of lost wax casting of metal icons survives in Swami Malay, four kilometers from Kumbakonam. And you're looking here at some images from the metal icon casting foundry of Swami Malay, the atelier of Devasena Stapati and his sons, Radha Krishna Stapati, who is seen here at work making a wax model of a Nataraja image to be cast. And typically the techniques of measurement used the Talamana cannon and the Odiole or the palm leaf and the Talamana canon are also described in the Silpa Shastras. And the lost wax process is mentioned as Madhu Chahista Vidhana in the Silpa Shastras. And here the wax model is covered by numerous layers of clay, alluvial clay from the Kaveri uh, uh, Delta to make the mold. And then 
The mold is heated under numerous layers of cow dung cakes or the rati, so that there's complete um, uh, uniform heating of the mold so that the wax is then expelled out and then the molten metal is poured into the mold. Now, there is also a lovely metaphorical reference to the casting process in the poetry of Andal, the ninth century mystic woman saint and devotee of Vishnu. In her well-known composition, the Nachiar Thirumori, she likens the downpour of rain from clouds to the metaphor of the release of wax from the mold in the process of metal casting and evokes Krishna as a skilled craftsman. And she writes, my beautiful love, it is as if he has put clay around me and poured wax into the heart. And in fact, the mold itself is described as karu in Tamil, which is a reference to the womb. So there is this analogy with the birthing process. And in the workshop of Radha Krishna's Tapati, you see here how the metal is melted and then poured into the molds. And there are various aspects of ritual which underscore these processes. For instance, the heart itself has a trident which symbolizes the Lord Vishnu. And even as they pour, just behind the pouring heart where the molds are placed, uh, there are offerings, ritual offerings of coconuts and flowers and lemons and so on to uh, ward away the evil eye to enable an auspicious casting. And it's also interesting that some aspects of the textual descriptions in the Shilpa Shastras are also adhered to in some of these processes. For instance, the medieval peninsular text of the Manasol Lhasa by the Chalukyan king Someshwara in the 12th century mentions that you should use a lighted wick near the mouth of the crucible. And in fact, as you see here, Swaminathan Sapati is holding a stick with a lighted wick at the end. And there is a technical function to that because that would enable that uh, the metal as it gets poured doesn't get oxidized so that it maintains a reducing condition at the mouth of the uh, mold as the pouring uh, goes on. And one is also reminded of Stella Kramrish's words that Shilpa is a complex concept constituted also of rite and ritual. Therefore, Shilpi or craftsman is more than a mere technical performer. He becomes an agent of magical and divine powers. And of course, the images are also elaborately finished in today's times. Well, a lot of my study was also on the technical analysis of bronzes, which I have not gone into so much over here, but I did want to make a mention of a couple of interesting findings which also connect to uh, the craft and the artistry surrounding the making of the Nataraja image. I had used a technique called lead isotope analysis for archaeometallurgical fingerprinting to tell apart bronzes of different uh, schools or made at different periods from different sources of metal, using which one was able to differentiate uh, the Pallava bronzes from Chola and Vijayanagara and so on. And one of remarkable finding was that a Nataraja image in the British Museum could be attributed to the Pallava period. And usually, of course, we think of the Nataraja image as having come into vogue in the Chola period. And uh, it's interesting to find here that there is an image which actually seems to predate the Chola period and can be attributed to the Pallava period. And indeed, when you look at it again, it does fit certain Pallava characteristics. For instance, there is a 7th century Pallava Freeze in Siya Mangalam, which has the leg extended in what we describe as the Bhujanga Trasita Karana, which is a serpent fright movement. And in fact, just below that lifted leg, you also see that there is a serpent lurking around. So there is that attempt in the 7th century Pallava Freeze to depict the Bhujanga Trasita Karana. So it's not really surprising then that we have this Pallava bronze depiction of Nataraja dancing in Bhujanga Trasita Karana. And this, of course, marks a difference from the earlier depictions of Nataraja. For instance, in Badami, you see the 6th century spectacular Chalukyan Natasha in which Nataraja dances in the Chatura Tandava posture. And what I had also done was to undertake a collaborative study with the late astrophysicist Dr. Nirupama Raghavan, where we attempted a plotting of the star chart positions of the Orion constellation onto this Pallava Nataraja bronze. 
to point out that there is some correlation between the iconography of Nataraja and the observations of the star positions. And in fact, this uh, exploration also drew from some of the writings of the late Ganapati Stapati, who was a master stone sculptor from Mahabalipuram in Tamil Nadu, where he had written in Chitra Chennul in 1982 that the Nataraja icon would be visualized in the six white stars that surround the red star Thiruvadurai, which is actually Alpha Orionis, and which is the star of Shiva. And Alpha Orionis is also known as Beatty Juice and falls on the shoulder of right shoulder of Nataraja. And there is also a sketch in a book uh, by Chokulingam of 1946, which was given to me courtesy late Raja Dikshitar of Chidambaram, where it talks of the observance of the Arudra Tandava Darshanam in the month of Margari in December, where the Orion constellation can be seen right ahead or overhead of the Chidambaram temple. So it does convey the sense of correlation between, you know, the constellation positions and the anatomy of the Nataraja bronze. And it also may explain that lifted leg because then the leg seems to extend towards Sirius, which is known as Mridavyada and also had some correlation with the Nataraja icon. And one is also reminded of the lovely verse by Appar of the 7th century, the Tamil poet saint, who writes, The Lord of the little chamber filled me with honey, will fill me with sky, nilavu, and make me be. So there is the sense of being and becoming, which the act of dance and linking between the human and the cosmic and the divine all bring about. And I must say, I was also very privileged that IGNCA has brought out a booklet, Cosmology and, and Nataraja, which had an article by Ananda Kumaraswamy, the celebrated article on Dance of Shiva, along with two of my own articles. And that is also a great privilege. Well, now I move on to uh, the other crafts. And in Nagamandala, in the Mandya district in Karnataka, in the Kaveri region, which is also a historical town going back to the Ganga period, there are certain other very interesting aspects of the Vishwakarma tradition that survive. And as seen in parts of Tamil Nadu with the Kamala Teru, there is a dedicated street known as Acharavidi or the streets of the Achari of the Vishwakarma, where the Vishwakarma metal workers resided. And traditionally, two subcasts of the Vishwakarma lived in Nagamangala, the Kulachar, or the blacksmiths, and the goldsmiths, and the carpenters, and the Matachars, who are the coppersmiths, and the foundry workers. And they were also divided into various gotras as per the Vedic prescriptions. And uh, you see here the Vishwakarma temple of Kalikambal in Nagamangala, and the goddess Kalikambal, who is also worshipped here. And Sri Raghu, who is a Matachar bronze caster, is himself a Vishwabrahman or the Vishwakarma priest. And there is also the processional worship of the Utsava Murti, the elaborately decorated metal icons, which of course goes back to our Agamic and medieval Tamil temple tradition here. And this is an unfinished bronze of Vishwakarma, which is made at Nagamangala, which uh, visualizes him as a five-headed and four-armed deity holding various attributes, including the musical instrument of the Veena, and you also have some attributes here, such as the rosary, which connected to Brahma. And you're also seeing in this slide Brahma from the early Chola depiction in the Nageshwara temple, the ninth century Nageshwara temple, where he's also shown with the uh, rosary and the three heads. And it's interesting that the image of Vishwakarma, which was made by Srikanta Stapati and their family for uh, the temple to the goddess Kamakshi Amman in, in Jaffna in Sri Lanka. And that is actually going to be sent there to that Kamakshi Amman temple. And Kamakshi Amman is also worshipped by many of the Shilpacharis and Kamalar and so on. I and mean, I'm grateful to Shikanta Sapati for this image. Of course, in that unfinished image, you also see the runners, which were basically wax channels to make the metal flow more uniformly. And they would have been then cut off but for me, actually, this unfinished version has a certain, uh, you know, majesty of its own. Well, the master craftsman Chennapa, who works in Shiv Shivarapatna in Karnataka, had also recounted a myth, which to some extent also exemplifies the links between the practices in Karnataka and with Tamil traditions, where he mentioned that a shilpi or a sculptor 
Basava Lingacharya was traveling from Kanchipuram to Tamil Nadu, and then he spent a night at Dharma Shala near uh, the village of Shivarapatna, and then he drew a very beautiful idol. And when the king saw that, he encouraged him to live and practice there, and that's how the art flourished in the village and so on. Now I'll move on to the uh, woods making tradition also so that I can show you a clip of one of the DVDs that we made. This was entitled Fading Songs of the Anvil, the Blacksmiths and Wood Steel Makers of Southern India and Golconda. And uh, this also touches upon some of the living traditions of the Vishwakarma, as you will see. Well, to just, I won't try not to dwell too much on the technical aspects, but to just explain that woods or is derived from the Tamil word ukku or uruku, which is also, of course, used in um, other parts of southern India, which refers to the process of melting. And the term yegu or eku also describes spears in Tamil Sangam texts of the early Christian era. Now, Woods was a novelty because it was a high carbon steel with about 1 to 1.5% carbon, which was not widely known in Europe. And it was exported to forge these uh, very fabled Damascus swords, particularly in West Asia. And these swords were known to have this very fine alternating pattern of the lightly edged cementite and darkly edged uh, perlite, which resulted in this wavy pattern, which is called Damask in Arabic. And that was very much sought after, uh, for which the woods was traded very widely to West Asia. And in some of my archaeometallurgical studies, I was able to identify some crucible fragments from Mail Sirivalur in Tamil Nadu near Tiruvannamalai. And if you take a cross section of the crucibles, you find that the remnants are of ultra high carbon steel with about 1.5% carbon. And the speciality of the steel was that it yielded a very high cutting edge and it could also be forged very heavily due to these superplastic properties. Now, most of the techniques of actually forging and working with Dukku and Woods have died out, although the blacksmiths have some memories. And close to the site of Woods making also is a foundry of the Karuman Vishwakarman in Singarapatte in Tamil, in Tirvanamale in Tamil Nadu. And it's interesting that Zosimus, the Greek in fourth century, had also mentioned that the Indians fused iron in crucibles to make weapons. So this is a long-standing tradition, and I won't go to, into the antiquity, but we are having some finds which go back, for instance, to the third century BCE and so on. But coming back to the living tradition, well, the accounts of Tavernier in 1679 had suggested that tens of thousands of ingots of woods were being traded from Hyderabad and Golconda regions in northern Telangana to Persia, and which was the only kind of steel which could be damasked, as, as I was mentioning. And there are some wood steel ingots which have been found, as you can see at the bottom of this slide, which is from Kona Samudram in northern Telangana. And late Ukukumari blacksmith Mandaloji Gangaram is seen here holding up some of the debris from wood steel production. And it's in its time, this area of northern Telangana preceded the rest of the world and preceded Sheffield and so on and being a great producer of high grade steel, which was exported around the world. So it was a great pre-industrial activity. And the travelers accounts also, for instance, of Bukhanan in Mysore, point to the survival of Wood's traditions there as well. He had traveled around the Mysore region just after the fall of Tipu Sultan, and he points to the packing of wrought iron with leaves and stems and carb carbonaceous materials into crucibles to make wood steel as well in the Mysore region. And at the bottom, you see that we are examining some two years. I'm seen here with Dr. Jai Kishan, who was one of our collaborators and who had also done a lot of identification of uh, uh, steel making and cannons and so on in the Telangana region. And just to show you what uh, the actual microstructure of a woods blade looks like, the toddy tappers in the Telangana region still use woods blades. And you can see that it has a typical structure of politic steel surrounded by the network of cementite, which is a classic wood structure. And when you forge that, you get that beautiful wavy damask pattern. But there's also a very rich um, oral tradition and intangible history tradition surrounding the Kukamaris in northern Telangana. And it also has a very well-known temple to the goddess Mamai in Kona Samudram. And Mamai is uh, a goddess worshipped by the steel makers. 
And the head priest from the Okukamari clan uh, is the one who mediates the temple. And the fivefold artisanal community also join in the worship over here. And there are also other customs such as the worship of the artisanal tools on special days such as on Yugadi Day and Ayudha Puja and so on. And the blacksmiths also have their own songs. For instance, the blacksmith Sayana sang in Telugu in praise of the goddess Mamai, singing of how uh, refuge was sought in Sankaramma, and they sing of Kamakshi who blessed Kanchi with her pleasant gaze and of Bala Tripura Sundari, the mother of the five Vishwakarma communities. And it seems that the place of Kanchipuram is very strong in the historic memory of the craftspeople. And Vijaya Ramaswamy had also pointed out that Kanchipuram is the mulasthanam for the crafts of the Kamalar. So there are these interesting connections that one finds from field investigations as well. I had briefly also touched upon Kalari Payatu, which is the martial art form of the Malabar and practiced here by the Kalari master Vijayan in Kori Code. And I also mentioned this because more recently, UNESCO has also been taking an interest in the Kalari Payatu tradition. And Dr. Venu Gopal had also contacted me and I had shared some of these studies which I had made on this spectacular Urumi blade, which is a kind of flexible sword. You know, it coils up totally. And as you can see here, this is Vijayan's daughter. And then it is flung out so that it spreads out and then it's uh, slashed and swashed and is a very swashbuckling kind of uh, 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 martial art form. But there are only a few blacksmiths or kollans who have the knowledge of working with these blades of the Urumi. And I was able to identify one of these kollan uh, here. And what was interesting that it was found that this blade is made of what we describe in modern terms as spring steel, which is perlitic 0.8% carbon steel. And uh, that's why it's able to take all this coiling and uh, flexibility and so on. And it was also used in uh, medieval clocks and so on at some point, much later, of course, in the same, in, from about the 18th century onwards. But it seems to have been also part of the uh, repertoire of uh, Indian tradition of ferrous metallurgy. Now I'll take you to a, a clip from this film, The Fading Songs of the Anvil. And uh, this has been made by... Uh, in the remnants of the blacksmithing practices of the present, we catch some glimpses of the enormous skills of the past, the ways in which the iron tool is cut at red heat and sliced and shaped and hammered and made pliant in the hands of the master blacksmiths. Blacksmiths like Gangara lived very close to the actual production of wood steel, as seen at Konapuram. Here you're looking at one of the bases or tops of the crucibles. You still see the streaks of rusted iron on it. Saranamma Mangala Purishan Kalamma Karuna Guru Mammu Kama Chamma Kanchi Go Kantarra Gari Pitti Vamma Panchada Yuga Vadi Balamma Yamma Kopedi Pula Sochyamma Yamma Yepudu Dipadu Elaguma Yamma The mention of place names from Tamil Nadu in the songs of the blacksmiths such as Mailapur and Kanchipuram, point to intriguing connections whereby the Telangana Mamai cult may be linked to Kamakshi, the patron goddess of the Kamalar in Tamil Nadu. The goddess Kamakshi 
was worshipped by the Kamalar community of artisans of Tamil Nadu and Kerala, who were also organized as part of a fivefold grouping of artisans akin to the Vishwakarma. See, there are several lilies which is in the Mudakamar people. Now they switch over to agriculture works and simultaneously. So when you they, say Mudakamari, they were actually only doing yeah, iron smelting. Mm -hmm. Not this is very processes. wonderful site. We have crucible site as well as building site. This and is how close, old crucible site. This is. How close were the Mudakamari living? Because this very near there is a Lakshmipuram. There are several uh, families still there. And here in uh, Kaleda, we have shifted to Vakurava. Vakurava, there are 300 families. But they don't have any memory now. Okupanji Kamaru. Now I return to a discussion on the bronze and bell metal workers. And I take you back to the spectacular temple, the 12th century temple of Dharasuram in the Chola heartland in near Kumbakonam. And this area has also nurtured several other craft traditions. For example, at Nachar Koil near Kumbakonam, which was a spectacular center for making lamps and various other artifacts. The lamps or the kutuvilaku were assembled of several parts as seen at the Patarai or workshop of Kamalar Govindrajan. And here you also see ladies and we're engaged in the crafts. Lakshmi has, is herself from a Kamalar community and she uses the alluvial clay from the Seri next to her to make a, a range of molding materials which she sells to the Pumpuha showroom on a daily basis. And the Kamalar Tere in Nachar Koil was originally the street where the Kamalar have lived, but now they have moved further out. I should also mention that lamps were also made in Kerala by very traditional means, such as at Irinjilakuda and Nadavarambu. And there is also a very lively bell making cooperative society there near Trishur. And here, interestingly, they totally eschew the use of modern lathes and so on, which has crept in in some of the other workshops. And they insist very much on using the traditional process because handcraft is something that the Kamalar and Vishwakarma communities were also very proud of as being part of their identity. And as you can see here, this is a hand turned lathe where the axle is made of wood and it is turned by hand using ropes. And then there is a resin mount onto which a part of the lamp is placed. And then it is hand turned and a spatula is pressed against this uh, lamp, which as it turns, it gives this very fine polish. And it's really as good, if not better than what you might get with a machine polish. The fading art of lost wax casting of bell, temple bells is also to be found at Nachar Koil in Tanjavo district. And you're looking here at a bell in the Dharasuram temple. I have to say, though, that it's a replacement for the old temple bell, according to the priest, which had got damaged. And you see here late Govind Rajan, who was a master bell maker of Nachar Koil. And first, again, an axle is placed. It's a hand lathe made of a wooden frame. And then several layers of the molding clay are added to form the base of the mold for the bell. And then very fine layers of wax are added on to form the, uh, the wax model of the bell. And that is again turned by hand with a spatula uh, placed against it to get a very fine finish. And then it is covered again with numerous layers of clay to form the final mold. The wax is heated and melted out as you've seen and the metal is poured in and then you get the final cast bell. But it's also interesting that the uh, 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 the, the microstructure of the bronze bell, which was made recently at Nachar Koil, is found to be of as cast leaded hyatin bronze, where basically you have, uh, you can see in the microstructure that there is this black uh, globules of lead, and it has an as cast dendritic structure, and the shinier, whiter parts is of this 
higher tin phase of delta bronze phase. So it is a leaded higher tin bronze. So they use a specific alloy for this purpose. And it's also interesting that at uh, Nachar Koil, uh, Govindrajan would tell us that he would also make bells for churches. Though for the Hindu bells, he said the importance is the flange, which gives this very sonorous ohm sound. The making of vessels or cauldrons known as urali used for temple feasts and such like has also been practiced traditionally in Kerala by different sets of artisans known as musaris. And you're also looking at a very spectacular medieval urali, which is in the Madurai Temple Art Gallery, which is more than a meter uh, in diameter. And here again, the urali mold was first made using the lost wax process and using a hand lathe and then covered with numerous layers of clay. And you also see here great attention being paid in Irinjala Kuda and Kerala to the layer that was actually applied against the wax model. That photograph, though, was taken uh, several years ago. And the, the, that lay, layer which was placed right against the wax model had a lot of um, uh, soot and carbonaceous material also so that it would form a very fine uh, layer even in terms of modern materials as the for, for the molding material and then they had these different types of indigenous furnaces you're looking here at some slides from manar where they had a very unique kind of furnace for the de-waxing of the molds the early molds were packed inside something which is really like a hemispherical brick kiln and then all the wax was melted out and in this way the molds were preheated and then the metal could be poured into the mold now, it's interesting that the 11th and 12th century Geniza documents of Cairo also mention the old vessels being sent to the Malabar and new ones being sent back to West Asian ports by the Jewish merchants. Um, and this is reported in Goiton and so on, which gives a real sense of the significance of the Malabar metalworking traditions. I know that uh, Molly G was also involved in a very interesting exhibition on the Geniza documents and so on. So um, this is also a very interesting aspect of the intangible heritage to be explored further. Well, I'm sorry to plunge you back into some technicalities, but I think that is important to take you through the next couple of crafts, which are also very important in terms of understanding the legacy of the Vishwakarma and the Kamalar. Now, although South Indian bronzes are described as panchaloha or five metal icons, in act actual practice from the analysis of medieval images that I had made, they are found to be mainly leaded bronzes or leaded brasses, which means that they had copper alloyed with lead and tin or copper alloyed with uh, zinc and lead and so on. So they're not literally five metal in that sense. And I show you this phase diagram also to show you that typically that the Chola bronzes had less than about 15% tin, which is that they are alpha cast um, bronzes, whereby the tin content does not really exceed the alpha phase composition. Now, as you keep adding more and more tin to bronze, it actually becomes more and more brittle, which is why you don't find as cast higher tin bronzes. That's not very suitable. And the lead was in fact added to make the bronze more castable. However, at a composition of about 23% tin, if you look, you'll see the Greek alphabet beta, which forms with, with, between about the temperature range of 600 to 750 degrees centigrade. Now, it's really interesting that in ancient times, they were also able to manipulate and uh, optimize the presence of this beta phase. And this very spectacular heightened bronze vessel that you're looking at from the Iron Age context in Adi Chinlur in Tamil Nadu, which is now in the Government Museum, Chennai, has a structure which we call draught and quenched high tin beta bronze, which is basically that a 23% tin bronze is heated to this composition range of formation of beta phase between 600 and 700 degrees centigrade, and then rapidly cooled or quenched so that that needle-like beta phase gets retained. And the retention of that beta phase is very important because that prevents the embrittlement of the alloy. It also gives the alloy uh, different properties of musicality and tonality and golden luster, which as you will see later in the slides to come, those were exploited. 
And just to explain to you what would happen if that bronze had not been quenched, if you look at this 19% tin bronze vessel, you see this network, a sort of uh, silvery gray network forming there instead of the needles of alpha phase. And that is this embrittling alpha plus delta eutectoid, which actually embrittles the bronze. But I should also mention that the delta phase, which gives that silvery color, was also being optimized in a particular craft tradition for making metal mirrors, which I will also describe, whereby they had a composition of about 33% tin bronze. And again, if you look at that copper tin phase diagram, you'll see that about at 33% tin in copper, you get the formation of this Greek alphabet delta, which forms in a very you know a narrow composition range. And so they were optimizing this presence of delta phase at 33% because this delta phase has a very silvery white color and gave a very good mirror making material, as you will see. And these are some very important archaeological examples of heightened bronzes from Kodumanal in Tamil Nadu. There's a vessel which was excavated by the State Department in Archaeology, which I had found to be a heightened binary, 22% tin bronze. And you can see how thin the rim is. And in the, um, uh, in the 19th century, Greeks had unearthed these very remarkable vessels from the Nilgiri cairns, many of which show very thin rims and complex fluted shapes and decorations and so on. And these have been divided between the British Museum and the Chennai Museum. And several of these also from analysis are found to be rot and quenched heightened beta bronze, as you can see from the microstructure. Now, what is interesting is that there is also a surviving tradition amongst the Kamalar which I'll show particularly in Kerala, of making vessels of rotten quenched height in beta bronze. And you can see that the microstructure of this more recently made vessel is exactly the same as the microstructure of this vessel from the Nilgiri cairns, which shows the needle-like beta phase and the annealed alpha islands from hot forging and quenching and uh, thereby preventing the embrittling formation of delta phase. And you can see why this alloy was sought after as well, because this vessel, which has been polished and all that has this wonderful golden luster. And starting from a diameter of about uh, 15 centimeters, they have hot forged it to about 30 centimeters and then quenched it. And this tradition also survived in Palakkad for a number of years. And as you can see here, the uh, Kamala is using the bag bellows to power this hearth and an ingot of heightened bronze is being annealed. And then it is hot forged with this several cycles using these very heavy ha hammers called the Cherangalam. And this goes on in several different cycles of annealing and hot forging, annealing at about 650 degrees centigrade, this ingot of 23% in bronze. And then finally, when it has been wrought to real fineness, then it is quenched, heated and quenched so that the plastic beta phase gets retained and polished so that you get this golden luster. And you also see here uh, Mr. Abdul Rahim, who ran a foundry which employed the Kamala to make heightened bronzes till about uh, 2008. And these days, uh, I'm sitting here surrounded by all these wonderful heightened bronze vessels, but these were not intended for a museum, but they were actually uh, in the workshop of Kamala Mohandas, who now uses these mainly to make musical symbols because there's really no market for the old vessels and hence they are all uh, recycled and made into musical symbols or the Ilatalam, which is a very big part of the repertoire of performing arts in Kerala and the accompaniments with the temple procession and so on. So you see here this blank of uh, the remelted heightened bronze ingots from this uh, vessels which have been remelted and then again, the cycles of annealing and hot forging and quenching, and then the scraping and so on to reveal this golden polish of the symbols. And the microstructure also of these symbols reveals those needles of quenched beta phase, though it's a dendritic structure of alpha phase. And one aspect of the ethno-archaeological study was that the reason that you find these vessels quite often in the Nilgiri Hills is because also the Todas the, the tribal communities of the Torah has also valued these vessels and collected them over time. So it's not surprising that many are actually found in association with the cairns and so on. And there were also uh, blacksmithy practices which survived in the Nilgiris, for instance, amongst the uh, Kollan blacksmiths of the 
Kota communities, and this is a Kota Kokal in Koli Malay. Even the term Koli Malay seems to be linked to the term Kolan or blacksmith. And you see here the Kota priest who is in this blacksmithy workshop, and he's also taking an interest in um, blacksmithy. Of course, the Kotas in these communities don't fall into the formal categories that we know of Vishwakarma and so on, but they also follow their own autonomous worship practices. And they have their own temples to Aymanur and Ammanur, which you can see in the background there. And most interestingly, the Kotas and the Todas and so on, they still live amongst this legacy of Cairns and Megaliths and Menhirs, you know, forming this linkage to this Iron Age megalithic period, which makes it all very fascinating with a lot of scope for further study. Um, and now I'll show you a clip from our documentary, The Remnant Music Recycled Metal the rot bell metal workers of the Malabar. Um, and again, I'm grateful to Janapada Sampada and project director Molly Kaushal. And uh, the script and narration and direction has been by me and the cinematography by Balaji. And after this, I will go to the uh, mirror making tradition and then uh, probably bring the talk to the close. But first I should show you this clip now. Chola period saw a tremendous efflorescence in a range of fine arts and crafts traditions ranging from about the late 9th century to the 13th centuries. These covered the arts of sculpture, bronze, image making, metal casting, making of ritual bells which were used in worship, and a whole range of artifacts from uh, lamps and such like the legacy of which we still see in this Kaveri Delta, this very fertile and rich Delta region. The Kamala of Tamil Nadu and Kerala made ritual and utilitarian artifacts in bronze, such as bells, vessels, and symbols. In fact, when I went to Nashar Kovil in the late 70s, early 80s, you know, rows of homes were manufacturing this velakum. What you call bell metal lamps. Yeah, bell metal lamps and also bell metal what do they call the single, you know, the, the, the plate. The elusive bell metal plate represents a skilled indigenous technology of heightened bronze working. <laughs> The Ilatalam or metal symbol is an exuberant instrument which is widely used in temple rituals. But behind the music is a tale of loss of a great metalworking tradition, a tale of remnant music and recycled metal, the saga of the Kamalar. This is also seen from the megalith of Kodumanal excavated by the state archeology span in Chennai, which yielded an extraordinarily thin perforated vessel. Bronze of a composition of about 23% tin has been extensively hot forged and then quenched to give vessels of an extraordinary thinness down to less than a millimeter. But there's a very interesting account going back to the time of Alexander's general Miakis, who uh, visited the Indus region. And according to Strabo's geography, uh, Miakis is said to observe this would have been in about the third century BC. He observed that the Indians used vessels which were like pottery because they shattered like pottery when they were dropped. The broken pieces of heightened bronze vessels are weighed meticulously on scales. Mohandas pour the molten metal into the flat sand mold. Thank you. 
The simple blank is forged by a process whereby one holds the blank and two other craftsmen hammer it alternately while it is turned consecutively by the man holding down one of the blanks. They had their own temple where they worshipped, dedicated to the Hindu god Vishnu. This is part of a larger trend followed by the Vishwakarma communities of craftspeople and the Kamalar of Nachar Koil, where they followed largely autonomous worship practices. Kurumba Kuti from the tribal Kurumba community in Nadavarambu has been washing vessels and spectacular lamps and urulis and otupatram from the temples for years and she has watched the decline of these metal crafts. Abdul Rahim says that even now there is a demand for the use of odu or heightened bronze vessels for weddings but that the Kamala community have died out or have stopped doing this. He points out that the one who knew the exact melting point and weight of copper and tin to make the alloy was a Kamalan. So now I take you to the last part of my talk, which is about the skilled metalworking traditions of the heightened 33% tin bronze mirrors made in Aranmula in Kerala. Aranmula, of course, is also known for the Aranmula Parthasati Temple and the spectacular snake boat races along the Pampa River for the Onam festivities. And you see here, of course, the Parthasati Temple. And since I was talking about the Utsava Murtis, I also managed to capture this photograph of the priest uh, taking the Utsava on his own head, which is also rather moving because we know that the Utsava Murtis were being taken on temple poles and all that. But this seems to be an even more archaic practice where it was actually taken around in procession on the priest's uh, uh, head. Now, the Aranmula Kannadi was a part of the auspicious set of the Ashtabangalyam of the Nair Brides, one of the eight auspicious articles which formed part of the wedding trousseau of the Nair Brides. And there is also an interesting myth which uh, uh, about the making of the Aranmula mirror, whereby uh, we were told by uh, one of the craftspeople that the Raja of Aranmula had uh, in fact ordered the making of this metal mirror based on the dream of a widow, Parvati Amal, who saw this very shiny material in her dream. And then he urged the craftspeople to actually make a, a crown of the mirror. And the um, um, rather, the based on the myth uh, conveyed to the craftspeople, they made a crown uh, of this metal as per the dream of Parvati Amar. And that satisfied the Raja, and hence he commissioned them to stay and work there. And interestingly, they are again said to have migrated from Shankara Koil in Tamil Nadu. So, well, if you look at this uh, slides here, um, you're looking at the uh, picture of Janardhan Achari, which was taken several years ago. He's no more. And as you can see, it's actually really as good as a modern metal mirror, although it's made of this composition of bronze of 33% tin. And if you look at the microstructure there, it is completely different from what I showed you before of the lower tin bronze compositions, which looked very goldeny or coppery. And this is really totally silvery because this is the color of this alloy. And that's why they were aiming for the specular 33% composition of bronze. Now that alloy, of course, is very brittle. 
And the whole uh, process of casting was uh, such that it was aimed to minimize the brittleness of the alloy and to get the best possible casting. And you see on the top what the ASCAS blank looks like, which has been mounted on a wooden board before the polishing process. And to cast that blank as well, they use a very skilled process, a closed crucible cum mold, as I would describe it, where the uh, crucible and mold are actually joined. Because in the earlier casting process, I showed you an open casting in uh, Swami Malay. But here, this is a co closed crucible uh, cum mold process where the metal to be cast is kept in this cup, which is then enclosed. And there is a channel by which it can flow into this thin space between two disc molds. And when this crucible cum mold is tipped over and heated in the furnace, so the alloy melts and then flows into that thin gap. And the purpose of this closed process is that it minimizes the oxidation losses, which would happen in an open mold process. And here you see uh, what this very spectacular alloy looks once it's polished. It's mounted, the blank is mounted on a polishing board. And in fact, even in the polishing process, there are very interesting technicalities because as I was mentioning, the Delta bronze alloy is very brittle. So they can actually powder it and use it as a polishing paste, which works very well. It, it works as a polishing powder itself because that way it gets into all the gaps and the crevices and gives the finest possible uh, mirror finish, which is actually a point image and even better than the uh, glass coated mercury images in that sense. And you also have these very interesting sculptures such as at Belur, which depicts the Madanika holding a mirror, which almost looks like the wooden mount, which is being held up like that as a mirror. And you have several of these medieval examples, of course. And I've also shown here the uh, uh, daughter of Janardhan Achari Sudhamal Aranmula, who has taken up this craft and she's very active, and her son Niranjan Achari also, who has been uh, carrying forward the craft. And you're also here seeing here the workshop of uh, Gopukumar Achari of Aranmula. And uh, they have now, of course, revived from the floods which had affected that region because they live close to the Pampa River and so on. So there are now these new aspects as well with uh, their lives near the alluvial regions and you know aspects of climate change and so on. So now I come to my final slide and I'll point out that the above studies also suggest that the use of the alloys was not at random, but that there was a high degree of craft specialization woven around a certain empirical knowledge of the properties of the alloys and the types of techniques to exploit and so on. And I would also say that a recurring narrative theme with respect to the South Indian fivefold craft communities, which is reported, is the myth of the original dwelling place of the Kamalar, which is sometimes described as Kandar Kote or magnetic fort in different contexts by various scholars, including Thurston, Brower, Ramaswamy, Tathagata, Neogi, and others who have also done anthropological work and from other sources reported in the book. The Kandakote story of the Kamala in Tamil Nadu is in the nature of a historic lament which evokes the exalted ritual status that smiths once enjoyed, but thereafter their idyllic and divine world was shattered with their fall from grace to a lower stature whereby the Kamala or Vishwakarma was scattered in various geographical regions and forced to work for ordinary mortals. Such oral histories of the artisans and narrative devices which explain their abandonment or migration or presence or absence of certain festivities and which encapsulate a certain grandeur and tragedy provide compelling literary and artistic motives. The fact that often the past traditions were woven into a barter economy also underscores a certain detached philosophical mindset where the community members do not seem overly burdened by material wants, and many of them don't even charge more than the exact cost of the weight of metal and so on that they are uh, using. And so it seems that they are invested much more in a special relationship between ritual and function, maker and material, which I think is very remarkable and inspiring and something to take away and think about even to inspire future generations of, of uh, artists and scientists and so on. And I would also add that, of course, 
you know, metal crafts is a very um, physically laborious activity, and many have been moving away, you know, understandably like us into I like other professions into IT and so on. But I think that these nuances of the legacy are something which, at least through the documentation and through, uh, you know, the articulation about that, we can at least serve to keep these ideals in our mind as we look forward into the future. So thank you very much. And I should also acknowledge the support and guidance of Janapada Sampata, IGNCA, Professor Molly Kaushal, uh, R. Pant, Veena Joshi, Sachidanand Joshi, and Deepthi Navaratna. And there are too many people here to name, but I have listed them all. And a special thanks to the craftspeople and performers, and to the NIAS TCS Metal Crafts Heritage Initiative, the NIAS Exeter UKRD Initiative, and uh, some of my NIAS colleagues, uh, Dr. Jai Kishan, Dr. Tathagata Niyogi, um, uh, Professor Ranganathan, and late Professor Baldev Raj. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Srinivasan. It was indeed a very inspiring uh, talk where we got to uh, look at the many aspects of your uh, a uh, fascinating journey with the ethnographies and uh, ethno ethnoarchaeology, our ethnometallurgy as in the metallurgical aspects of your uh, various projects that deal with the metalworking uh, traditions of uh, South India. It's not very often that you find that ethno ethnography meets science or ethnography meets archaeology in such a scientific manner. We often don't get to uh, scientifically analyze the backstories or the knowledge systems that communities that make the objects that we use in our everyday life, or uh, we don't often get to even scientifically curate the, the stories that have, uh, um, that have been enmeshed with the technological innovations of the past. So it was indeed a wonderful opportunity. Thank you very much. On Facebook Live, we've been joined by many, many, many scholars, artists who are from across India who have commented uh, very positively about this uh, about this event. Uh, before we uh, move on to uh, Dr. Uh, Kaushal's uh, uh, observations and discussions, I'd like to briefly introduce Dr. Molly Kaushal. Uh, she is a professor of performance studies and head of the Janapada Sampada division at IGNCA. She uh, is. Uh, she focuses on the she was focused on the living traditions of the Rama and Ramayana and the Mahabharata and has made significant contributions in the field of uh, folklore documentation and bringing forth the tribal traditions, the tribal narratives of these uh, epics. Her current research is very fascinating. Her current research is focused on the migrant communities uh, in the mega cities. So it's this clash between the past and the, and the present and how the changing urban scapes in India is impacting the ritual practices and ritual spheres in the context of forming regional and political identities. Welcome uh, Dr. Moliji and uh, please over to you for your observations and remarks. Thank you. Uh, you know, uh, First of all, congratulations, Chardaji. This is a work that you've been engaged in for many, many years, and uh, it has come to a fusion. It is already there in the form of, a, if you look at the actual report, it's huge. And uh, is what Sharda has actually presented here is probably a friction of, of uh, a fraction of. Uh, of the work that uh, this uh, report uh, has really uh, accomplished. In, and one would wonder, because when right now, as she's presenting, uh, what she presented here today is very interesting that we, we, we are looking at a different history. And rather than calling it an alternative histories, I would call it simultaneous histories. So India has multiple streams, and each contributes to a to the civilizational discourse. Unfortunately, 
uh, we like the communities. I'm, I'm happy that when I listen to her and when I read her report and I look at her, her films that she made. So when I look at this history and the history of these communities, marginalized though, but still they have left remarkable imprint of their existence onto the landscape, onto the social, cultural, historical, political landscapes of of uh, of, uh, of our nation. When I come back to the north, unfortunately. I probably, and though there are communities, I mean, uh, though Sharda's mentioned in her report that Vishnu Karma is a term which is probably more, and also John Rahab has talked about it, that is more common in, in North India. You know, probably if usage is very restricted, and when you actually go to the a smith, whether you know, and here in the north, I would you know, whether they are the makers or the metal makers, or you go to the agarya, or you go to the part of uh, their mythologies are not necessarily being driven from, from that uh, archetype. Of this world. But that is sustained so well in the southern part. And then you see the And when you see this, I was fascinated that one common thread, even if Vishwakarma is there or not, because the furnace is there, the goddess Kalima is going to be there. Yes. You see, so the Kali is there, or Kalimama is there, and uh, so whether I will go to the agrarian communities of the Gantic plains who have the art as their, you know, in the German system, uh, a patron client system, you also then go to the tribal communities that you will see that this is probably more than Vishnu Karma. I think the myth that has the uh, has across different, uh, um, what shall I say, communities? Because within the communities, there are some communities, and then there's a larger framework of the Vishnu Karma myth. Uh, and why, why wouldn't Janpa Sampada actually get into something which is, you know, also very, very craft, not only craft, but it is also artisanal practice that Vijay, uh, Vijay Ramaswamy and actually at, at one of our houses was also somebody who could definitely And probably that is true again of the southern nations because you had to find from that spot, you know, where they got this first, finally they did have the temples, you know, and they, they did find their patronage there. Now, in the North India, that kind of patronage doesn't happen. Uh, interestingly, her report, you know, it starts, of course, with the iron pillar, and it ends as a short with the Arnamula mirror. It's a long journey, and in this journey, she has interwoven so many narratives. And this is what precisely the whole focus of the methodology that was, and that's why I'm remembering Kapilaji so much more today, because uh, if she had been there, she would have like had tension strategy and you know, because uh, and her blessing is that we have to look at all these queens in their interconnectedness, in the web. You cannot read the myth separately from the craft. I think many people have probably thought it also the these are cognitive structures of the actual practice. They constitute the practice, inform the practice, and they are also informed by the practices. And right starting from whatever you, know, then you also see the actual lives of, of, of your artisan community, your class people. So you would see that across, across the potential groups or across the class groups, this kind of structure would is available where the Identity needs to be assumed, identity needs to be recognized, and particularly when it concerns a certain uh, creative tradition of that community, its existence has to be divine, it has to be sacred. So 
So you, the community also get empowered by the creative acts that it is involved in, which gives rise then to the myth of a sacred descent, which is very, very important. But this sacred descent narrative also has to then uh, take into cognizance the actual social structures and social realities in which they really find themselves to be on the periphery. And in this whole journey of the of the Vishwakarma communities, and I put them in, in, in certain quotes because elsewhere they may not identify themselves with this particular myth, but with some other mythical structure. But nonetheless, what is common motive is that there is a divine sacred uh, descent and then there is a disintegration. And that is why the fourth story that you mention in the end becomes so important because it is to also talking about the migrations and it's talking about displacement and it's talking about the dispersals and it's talking about the lost patronage systems and the new patronages that are developing and how that really impacts the craft practices and both in terms of south and north you know uh, especially in the case of the metal crafts you can see uh, what a huge uh, difference that uh, that at least the recorded history provides us with you know we we do not know the pre prehistory yet to to discover that what what really was uh, happening in terms of 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 these communities and whether the there is too much of you know even anthropology when is looking at actually the artisanal and the craft communities of india is it, too much uh, into this whole caste hierarchy so one way you have only one kind of narrative and it is juxtaposed to the Brahminical uh, structures and then where the Lohar and why do they call themselves Vishwakarmas? Why are the Vish Vishwa Brahmins? They are because the Brahmins don't recognize them. So we get too much into the Dumont kind of an anthropological uh, study of these communities. The second kind of studies that happen is that they only look at the aesthetics of the art, you know, so, so the beautiful art, and they don't go into the actual processes, the actual, I mean, the scientific knowledge behind this. And when you mentioned, and you mentioned in your report also, that these processes are, uh, they're not random. It's not just that, you know, a one person decided there's a whole knowledge system, and there must have been ateliers who, who kind of, you know, transmitted this, this whole knowledge of what alloy to be mixed at in what balance at what heat what kind of bellows to be used so that whole technology that whole scientific knowledge and uh, unfortunately the ethnographers will not do it anthropologists will not do it the scientists who do that will not go back to the anthropology or to the ethnography so taking uh, sharda what she has done is that she's taken her studies beyond these narrow confines of uh, of uh, of disciplines Please. and it is truly an interdisciplinary work in which you you get to know about the communities you get to know about their narratives then you get to know about the actual process of making and then she's taking you right from it's the entire old Tamil country, if I can say, you have the Karnataka and you have the Tamil Nadu and you have the Kerala and you have the Andhra. So this whole tradition from this region in its, uh, in its wholeness and completeness uh, uh, is, is being reflected in the talk, in the films, in the uh, volume that she has, a monumental volume that she produced. So it's it's a one of its kind studies. Actually, IGNC's engagement with the Vishwakarma community started with John Brawls, makers of the world uh, thing. And uh, so these were the 90s and he was into that framework of structural analysis and into the binaries and, you know, binary categories and dualities. And though he talked about mythical structures and uh, uh, then focus on the Karnataka region, but the completeness of the whole thing was all, always felt that these studies are not complete and they cannot become part of si simultaneous histories of India unless this whole journey is taken. 
and because not just in terms of the of the of the vishwakarma communities just not just the metal craft you take the potters you take the weavers you take the terracotta where you know these are the knowledge systems that flourished with these knowledge systems the science came the social structures came the social organizations came a certain cognition a certain understanding of the universe a certain world views that 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 came to be informed and kept informing and that holistically hardly been documented in terms of uh, specific uh, arts and crafts practices in this country and i i'm so glad that sharda you fill that one one gap and probably it will also serve as a, as a model for the ways other studies in the crafts traditions can be done the rituals you know each each ritual at the each process why is that ritual what is that ritual being informed from we have other studies also we have uh, initiated the agaryas we agaryas we have taken up garya lohars or gadulia lohars we've taken the asur but you'll find that you know uh, holistic studies are becoming more and more difficult because these communities have ceased to practice either because of our administrative stupidities of declaring you know the declaring for example the places from where they could obtain their ore where their pastures i'm talking about now another area of knowledge you know once they, they they are restricted to the communities at the same time the self sustained village economies that existed are no more there third is that you are competing with not just the market you are also competing in terms of lifestyles and those competitions need very very different kind of patronage that uh, we are not able to provide and that is why these histories have got lost these knowledge systems have got lost so our histories only begin with medieval india medieval india was a wonderful age i i no no denying about that but uh, did something exist before that and have be able to study that so we are are uh, uh, we've been biased both ways yeah on the both sides of the so these biases can only be removed by thorough scientific documentation and when i mean scientific do documentation i'm really thinking in terms of this holistic documentation which bring in all those threads that make the mosaic for that little cup beautiful uh, bowl with that shimmering gold shine in it or for that mirror to come is not a just a product it's a journey of a civilization it's a journey of how transmission was handled it is a journey of what kind of knowledge systems existed it's a journey of what kind of uh, ways that identities were protected and uh, we we are uh, we lost a lot of it but as she has been able sharda has been able to discover this this history i'm sure that uh, other projects will also be able to discover these simultaneous histories of india and uh, we can begin to talk more scientifically about our scientific knowledge within quotes thank you very much molly ji it is indeed uh, it is it is indeed a need of our to actually formulate research methodologies in interdisciplinary paradigms which can actually uh, produce answers which are meaningful and productive and forward moving to all the disciplines involved in the interdisciplinary paradigm and today we saw a fascinating example we actually saw a role model for such holistic integrated and uh, meaningful mm -hmm. investigations that we could have uh, with respect to all of our performing arts so thank you very much for your uh, comments we do have uh, we have a lot of comments on the facebook platform we have a question from one mr mafuz who says uh, do we have analysis scientific analysis like the sem technique of swords made from damascus steel as 
uploaded by the Sultanate historian Fakri e. Mudabir during the reign of Sultan Iltamash. So yes. I'm sure Sadaji understands uh, <laughs> what. Uh, and I th she's in fact mentioned that in her report as well, right? right? So the chapter, right. first chapter, I right? think. Yeah, please, Sharda. You're to me, you know. So first of all, I should say a big thank you to Professor Molly Kaushal for those uh, very insightful and uh, um, heartwarming comments, which I think uh, explored and brought to light so many rich facets in the interviewing. So thank you so much. That was a real eye opener for me. And I think uh, you've also brought to light many of the you know, ways ahead in terms of looking at uh, things and connecting with the various historiographies. And thank you also deeply for your very uh, in, insightful and uh, pertinent comments. And I think this aspect of interdisciplinarity is very important uh, going forward. And also to integrate the craftspeople into the pedagogic system as well. That could be one right. way of providing value for them and for the students and so on. For instance, when we were in engineering, we probably didn't automatically uh, get a chance to learn of these things. Now, coming to the very interesting question. Um, yes, well, there's a whole a lot of study to be done there. It's only so much that one can cover in one monograph. It's probably work for a future monograph. And uh, uh, well, one problem with doing those kind of studies on the sword blades and things like that is, first of all, to be able to get access to uh, you know, uh, antiquities to study is not that easy, you know, because these are all uh, priceless artifacts. Some of the uh, sword blades, for instance, in the uh, Rajasthan Armory and so on have been studied, but these mainly in the collections in the US and so on by Verhoeven and, uh, you know, some studies on the patterning and such like has been done. So, of course, we can use SEM and, and such like studies, but we need to be able to get access to the swords. And there are fantastic uh, examples in the Mughal Armory and so on in, in the National Museum and various other collections. Um, you know, Rajput, Nizam's collections and so on. But getting access, I think, to study is, is the key problem there. But uh, since you also mentioned, uh, well, certainly from, um, you know, uh, in, in, from uh, the Aini Akbari, you actually have a mention of Nirmal, which is near the Telangana region as one of the regions which was producing uh, some steel and so on. So there needs to be more of looking at the textual sources as well to make connections and things like that. So. Yeah, thank you very much. We were also joined by our uh, ex member secretary, uh, Mrs. Veena Joshi, on the Facebook platform, and she sends us our best wishes and thanks you, Srinivasan, for a very informative session. That's a little bit of a tidbit from Facebook world. So the floor is now open for anybody uh, to ask a question. Please unmute yourself. We have time for just one question. Please unmute yourself and ask. A question if you would like to. Raghavanji? Yes, he's raising his hand. Uh, madam, uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yes, we can. Uh, I have a question at IGC uh, Yes, he, he is actually having technical, technical issues. Yes, yes, I am. Hello, IGC. I am working on uh, Vishwarma community again. Uh, the artistic Vishwarma craftsmanship and their artistic marvels. And only one particular question, Madam. Uh, this Arunula Tamil, and I was angered about the proportional content of the alloy, but I could not get this. But I have read your article uh, there you have uh, identified proportional uh, content of the alloy and uh, you uh, what is called identified this proportional representation of the elements yes um, so your, your question was, was, how did I identify the proportionality? Well, uh, this is not something that the craftspeople will tell you if that's your question, because there is a certain secretiveness 
uh, you know, amongst the craftspeople. So that was really by doing the analysis of, uh, you know, the I, I took very, very small um, uh, cross sections of maybe two millimeters cross section from some finished mirrors, um, both some antique mirrors and the current ones which were made, the blanks and so on. So it was really from the SEM analysis and the compositional analysis, atomic absorption spectroscopy and so on. Was that your question? Because it was a bit blurred. I couldn't really. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah. He actually asked how the proportionality was arrived at. How yes. the proportionality yeah. was arrived at. Yeah. yeah. So, um, well, as I said, the craftspeople won't reveal absolutely all their trade secrets, but they, <laughs> you know, they're able to measure uh, proportions of copper and tin. For instance, the uh, Kamala who made the, you know, the Otu Patram, they would tell you that it's um, 20 parts of tin to, uh, you know, 80 parts of copper and so on, which sort of arrives at the 20%. And likewise, you know, for the uh, alloy making for the mirrors. Of course, for the mirror makers, uh, you know, they procure pure copper and tin and then alloy it in that proportion that reaches, uh, you know, 23%. So these are all part of their, uh, uh, you know, uh, the knowledge systems. And they actually first cast an ingot of that 33% in bronze and they break it up into smaller parts and then pack it into the crucible mold for, for recasting really into the blank and so on. So. It's by weight, really. weight of tin to copper, and they also leave some for oxidation losses. But you need to leave me something to put in my future publication, so I cannot reveal. Looking forward to being in touch about it. <laughs> yes, balancing the fine art of uh, doing the science and communicating the science and writing about it. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Srinivasan. I guess uh, uh, we are out of time, so we will uh, close the session for today. I thank one and all for joining us on the WebEx platform, on Facebook, and uh, for all those of you who have uh, joined us here at the at the very interesting and, and information informative session. Thank you so much, Dr. Srinivasan. Thank you so much, Polly G. Thank you so much, Raghavan G, for joining us. It was a one, yet another wonderful virtual book reading session. Wishing you all a wonderful and happy weekend. Signing off from here. Thank you, and it's been a wonderful session. And thank you, Molly Ji, for mentioning Kapila Ji, because you're right, she was so warm. And, you know, that is exactly yeah. what she always did. She reached out and helped many of us, both metaphorically and literally. So thank you for that very precious account. Thank you. Wonderful. Good evening. Namaste. Namaste. Thank you, all of you. Thank you.